Season 1 of Notebook on Cities and Culture is brought to you by Carl Haley, Daniel Murphy, and Douglas Dollars, who reminds you to be present, be loving, and that life moves really fast. the subject of Graham Greene's The Quiet American comes up in conversation and you're talking to somebody who doesn't know what the book is and they say, oh, what's, what's that? That sounds like a fascinating book. What about, what about that person determines how you will explain The Quiet American to them? I've got to confess, I would describe it in the same way to anyone because The Quiet American is like Los Angeles as you were just talking to me about it. Uh, there's something for everybody there. And the main features are so intriguing that they would be an entry point for anybody, which is to say that he spins out, as you know, a very elaborate political fable and a very rending private story at the same time. So uh, certainly for many people, the entry to that book would be uh, this parable about the dance of empires. And as you know, it's... set and written in Vietnam in the early 1950s. It anticipates what's probably going to happen in Afghanistan three years from now and what happened in Iraq 50 years after the book was published. And it describes how the British Empire at the end of World War II was uh, realizing that its glory days were behind it, uh, was mocking because it envied the new American empire that was traveling to the ancient parts of the world, eager to turn them into versions of America. And Asia was hovering between them. But for me, each time I read it, I think the political parable can be exhausted in one reading. But the private stories of these three individuals wavering between realism and romance and trying to decide how much to give their hearts away to a stranger and how much to hold on to them, that gets more and more poignant uh, each time. So I would say the more committed you are to a private emotional story about love, uh, the more times you can reread The Quiet American. It's Notebook on Cities and Culture. I'm Colin Marshall, sitting down in downtown Los Angeles with Pico Iyer, making, a, you could say, a return to the program, or uh, his last appearance was on the predecessor to the show, The Marketplace of Ideas. We were discussing his whole body of work. Today we'll be discussing a new book he has out. He's just finished touring about it called The Man Within My Head. Graham Greene is... A or the or a man within his head, and there's much more to the book as well. There's, well, tell me this, Pico. You 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 mention in in the book that you signed a contract for a book or to write a book about your life in Japan as a befuddled foreigner or something like this, and you might not have used the word befuddled, but how did how do you get from there to a book about uh, your father and Graham Greene and brush fires and then so much more? Yes, I think I may have used very close to befuddled, happily bewildered foreigner, and. I think the beauty of books is that they write you more than the other way around. And almost any writer you've talked to, I'm sure, has said that <clears throat> once you get into a book, ideally, it takes over, it determines the kind of book it ought to be. And what you're hoping for is to be swept away from your plan uh, and into a place you never expected to arrive. And it's exactly like traveling in that way, that you arrive in Mexico City or Venice or Kyoto with a certain itinerary, and if everything goes well, the itinerary flies out the window within a few hours, and you're following uh, providence and intuition and circumstance into places you wouldn't have known that you wanted to see. So in this case, uh, while I was completing my last book on the Dalai Lama, I was beginning to write for my own pleasure, taking my imagination for a walk, fictional sketches involving Graham Greene, taking him to places he'd never been, imagining school friends of his reminiscing about him as a boy, taking uh, fictional characters from his books and putting them into places that they never went in his books. And I was doing it just as a break, I suppose, from the Dalai Lama. But I got so possessed by that that instantly it compelled me much more than the book I was contracted to write. And it's as if you're going through a rather stuck conversation with somebody and suddenly a stranger comes into the room and is so much more charismatic and intriguing that you want to talk to her instead. So I was really happy to be swept aside um, from my plan. I'm now that I've published the Graham Greene book, I return to Japan next week ostensibly with a view to writing that book on Japan at last, but I am not averse to being whisked away again by some unanticipated uh, 
projects. But I think a writer has to listen to intuition. And Graham Greene, to me, was more than almost any English writer of the 20th century about following the prompts of the subconscious and not trying to impose a conscious order on things. So in homage to him, I was very glad uh, to be taken on this senseless voyage instead of the one I planned. I'm reminded of something I've heard from Jeff Dyer, a writer we both know, that he, he's got a new book out called Zona. About It's a, a scene-by-scene, maybe shot-by-shot description of, of Andrei Tarkovsky's film Stalker, a film I love, but he said he was contracted to write a book about tennis. Mm. So how do you break this to a publisher, just to get that out of the way? What do you say when you say, well, this isn't going to be about Japan. This isn't going to be about tennis. This is, this is about something that's much, maybe you'll think it's less saleable, but li- listen to me. Well, I'm probably the ideal person to ask that question because Jeff and I share the same editor mm. in New York, and he's an unusually enlightened editor who often will say, doesn't matter, don't care about making the book sal- saleable. Uh, and that's what he said to me about my, my Graham Green book. He said, well, the sales force may be startled by this hybrid mutant, but don't worry, I'll take care of that. Follow your obsession, follow your passion and your curiosity. Now, in the case of Jeff, this is particularly important because the way he holds a reader is that you can tell he's following his interest in the most vagrant way and that every book is different from every other book and all he's doing is really pursuing his his passions into back alleyways of his mind and the world. Um, and that if Jeff were to write a book exactly as he had promised it to an editor, he wouldn't be being Jeff, and the editor would usually be enlightened enough to be disappointed. And I think it must also be said that editors know how writers work. That's almost what they do for a living. And so they know that almost invariably the writer doesn't know what the book is until he starts to write it. And whatever the writer promises... Um, that's not going to be what he delivers. And so I think the, an editor would only be shocked if you, Colin, for example, said, I'm going to write a 400-page book about Los Angeles, and lo and behold, six years later, you delivered a 400-page book about Los Angeles. That's what they're not <laughs> prepared for. I remember talking to Jeff about his proposed book on tennis, and it sounded fascinating to me, and I loved the fact he was writing about something he hasn't written about in book form before. But I also thought, well, Jeff has so many intriguing and idiosyncratic passions, probably another one will sweep him away. So I, in fact, have read the the Tarkovsky book and love the way that it's about almost walking down a street in your imagination and getting lost. Now, I mentioned in in that lead-up that your father is, is, to my mind, as big a player in this book as Graham Greene, and you know, he's, he's, he's there as your biological, actual, unchosen father rather than the chosen literary father of Graham Greene. But you know, the more I hear about your father, and I, I heard uh, you let certain facts out in, in your previous books as well. None of them were, were about him necessarily, but, you know, I've, I've heard so much, so much is fascinating, the sort of the utopian projects he would work on in the, in the, the, the Alfa Romeo and the bright yellow shirt and, and the, um, the sort of charismatic, the charismatic leader of students that he was. But I, gosh, I just feel like I still have the question of who he was. Do you, does that make sense to you? Uh, that's beautifully said. You described him perfectly, and I think you described many a reader's response to this book perfectly. And I must say, as you know, <clears throat> on the cover of this book, there's a picture of Graham Greene and a picture of my father holding me when I was two years old. And I was really, really anxious that the publisher not put the picture of my father and me in the book, because I told them, anyone who picks up this book, hoping to learn about my father and me, is going to be very, very disappointed. And this book, this photo is misleading. Uh, and that... I say, I think, in this book a huge amount about Graham Greene, but both myself and my father are rather sketchy and shadowy characters. And I think quite a few people already, maybe like you, picked up the book, saw that picture, hoped to learn more about my father, and put it down a little disappointed. And I think that's because my interest, especially in this book, is really not in my father and me, but it's in the archetypal pattern of fathers and sons. Uh, The way that every seems to me, a young boy growing up feels that to create himself, to make his own way in the world, to form his own destiny and identity, he has to turn his back on his parents and go usually in the opposite direction. And then 30 years on, he looks in the mirror or hears himself talking to Colin on the microphone, recognizes something familiar and realizes that he's rebelled against his parents until he's become his parents and that most of us find that kind of 
cyclical pattern, almost unavoidable, and daughters with their mothers, the same. So the beginning of your question was just perfect, because really this book is about not my father and me, but chosen fathers and unchosen. And that archetype about how we react against our circumstances by creating these imaginary, imagined fathers we've never met, in my case, Graham Greene, in counter-distinction to the people that we feel we know too well, even though ultimately in middle age I turn into not Graham Greene but my father. That is really what what fascinates me. And uh, I'm sorry that, uh, that the book probably will disappoint most people who want to know about my father, but I think it's mostly the cover that's to blame. And uh, funnily enough, I have a wonderful jacket designer. He lives here in Los Angeles, so I've never met her. And when she was planning the cover of this book, she found a beautiful, reflective, private, mysterious photo of Graham Greene. And I said, hallelujah, this is the best cover possible. But um, my, <laughs> my publishers said, no, if we have just Graham Greene on the cover, it'll look like a literary meditation, and nobody wants to read that. <laughs> and curiously, in interesting circumstance, after I'd finished the book, out of nowhere, somebody I haven't seen for 50 years since I was four, three years old, said we were just sorting out family photos and we came upon this picture and maybe it would have some meaning to you and sent me this very, very striking picture of my father and me in Oxford in 1959. Mm -hmm. So striking that the minute my publisher saw it, they wanted to put it on the cover of the book. And in fact, they instantly displaced Graham Greene entirely and put only the picture of me and my father. And so the cover finally was a compromised version where you have Greene and the Aya family photo in, in a kind of uneasy balance. But that reflects the fact that they had one vision for the book and I had um, the other. And they knew that readers would be more interested in me than, and my story than in a long-dead uh, English writer. But what I felt was the interest of this book is about how you tell your own story by looking at somebody unrelated to yourself. And as I say in the book, how blood relations are not the only important ones and how you can feel somebody who's never met you understands you better than your own friends and family, that you know a writer's most intimate guilts and terrors as you never know those of your own parents. And that's the double standard that really intrigues me. You could say the extent to which I don't know my father or my mother uh, is my theme, yeah. So mm -hmm. if the reader comes away frustrated, that may be a register of the fact I genuinely... I think almost the first time I write a lot about my father in this book, I say he was a mystery to me. And that mysteriousness is more important to me than any knowledge I have of him. It's it's like how one, one's father or mother might might feel the need to believe that, that they that they by definition know their children better than anybody else could. But, you know... you. I'm sure it's it's everybody's experience, especially in adolescence, when you you hear a parent claim to know you best, and but their description of you, of you seems rife with inaccuracies. I mean, I mean that that goes on to later in life as well. It's 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 there's a burden, the burden of the the burden that you will know perfectly or better than anybody else your relations or the people you see most. It, it weighs fairly heavily, doesn't it? So again, so so wonderfully said. And I have stepchildren now. And I and my wife, their, of course their mother, are um, always talking about them and figuring we know what's best for them and wanting to make their decisions and choose their partners for them because they've grown up and out in the world now. And yet, as you say, deep down I feel that by rights and by definition and my dream is that nearly every aspect of their lives, especially their private lives, is unknown to me. And by definition, I know nothing about what my stepdaughter is doing and saying with her fiancé or boyfriend of, of seven years, and nor should I. And indeed, the more, the deeper my ignorance and the greater I can acknowledge my ignorance, probably the better. And yet it's, as you say, it's so easy uh, to forget that. And I, I've told a couple of people as I've been traveling with this book about how <clears throat> last year my mother turned 80 and I threw a little party for her and some of her friends said well why don't you interview her at the end of the party and I was thinking well I'm not Colin that's not what I do for a living uh, but then I suddenly thought <clears throat> it'll give me the chance to ask things of her that I'd be too shy ever to broach in real life and my mother happily is an adventurous sort <clears throat> and was up for this so at the end of the party I said well you've now completed eight decades on this planet what is the m most important thing you learnt? And without hesitation, she said that you can never know another person. Mm -hmm. And I was 
instantly taken aback. And it was the rare statement that was proof of its own accuracy because I never knew that my mother thought that. Mm. It, in fact, it was the last thing I imagined she would say or that I imagined she would think. And then secondly, I thought, well, what does that say to and about me as her son? She's probably acknowledging, as your question suggested, that she doesn't really know me. I'm a, a mystery to her. And maybe saying that there are things about me she doesn't want to know. And maybe saying that she doesn't, never fully knew her husband, my father, as much as she would imagine. And a part of me was startled by that answer, and a part of me was enlightened, and a large part of me really rejoiced at it. And I think one of the things I get from Graham Greene is <clears throat> that there are three, three rules to life that I glean from Graham Greene. The first is you have to look at the difficult parts of yourself. The second is you have to look at the difficult parts of the world. And the third is you have to acknowledge that you can never know another human being. And the problems in life come not from the fact that we don't know another human being, but indeed from the presumption that we do, that we're prepared to be agnostic about so many things, including the most essential stuff of life. Is there a God? What happens after death? And yet with other people, we claim to a knowledge that we haven't earned. And that's where we really... Uh, need to be agnostic. And I've been thinking as I travel with this book how <clears throat> not knowing is a form of intimacy. And I've also been thinking about how as one gets older, the, I think most of us find the older we get, the less we know about the world and the more we see, as my mother bore out, how much lies outside our understanding um, and our comprehension. I remember when I first went to Japan 25 years ago, after one year there, I wrote a book um, of maybe 380 pages. Now I've been there 25 years, and if you asked me what I know about Japan, it would barely fit on a postcard or a, a haiku. And getting to know Japan has really been about getting to know how little I can claim mm. to know it, that, a, a, a rightful agnosticism. I think when young, we know it all, and the older we get, the less we can see we know. And so, um, so maybe this book is, among other things, about the virtue of agnosticism, about my saying I didn't understand my father and don't claim to and don't even need to, and about my saying equally, because Graham Greene as a writer had such a gift for the in intimacy on the page and put so much of himself nakedly on the page, it seems to me that I know him perhaps as I will never know anybody in real life. You have this 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 brief sketch of yourself at, at university, I believe, during or before an unexpected visit by your father, uh, describing yourself, I believe it's the same section. Describing yourself as a, as a sort of trying to get your hair looking like a like a lead guitarist, and uh, and believing that you believing that you knew everything. It, it's, it's I, I feel like I hear that so much about about teenagers and, and early twenties type people. I'm not so far from that age myself, but I don't feel like I feel like boy, I thought I knew everything in those days. Is something people say, but do, do we really? Do we really think we, we knew everything? And did, did we think we knew everything at that age? I can't, I mean, I, I can't remember having that kind of confidence. You know what I did? Did you? Well, th thank you again for reading the book so closely and for such a thoughtful question. And one thing I was sure I knew when I was 19 was my parents. As you were saying in an earlier question, I figured I had their number entirely. And I must say, <clears throat> as you know, in this book, I describe how I went through a classic English boarding school. And my school in particular is famous for producing people who are dangerously self-confident uh, and who know it trains you for taking over the world. It also trains you for knowing nothing about the other sex because it's an all-boys school and has been for 570 years now. And uh, I think I recognize people who come out of that school now because they are precocious in certain ways and do walk through the world with a somewhat unearned confidence, mm -hmm. but that very confidence allows them often to become prime ministers or CEOs or, or writers very early. So I actually, when I remember m myself at 19 in that scene in the book, I really felt I knew a lot. Uh, I, and I really didn't have the kind of humility might, one might expect, partly because we were v drilled in a hothouse environment. Very, very strong um, teachers, very, very strong fellow students. I remember one of my uh, friends that I'd been in junior high school and high school with became a professor at Caltech here at 19, and many others were on their way to doing things like that. So academically, we were as well drilled as I think most anyone in the English language uh, world could be. 
Uh, we'd learned Latin from the age of six and Greek from the age of seven and several other languages. And, uh, and most of us had done very well in our exams. And by the time we got to university, we figured that we were as well drilled as any 19 year olds could be. And there was a truth to that. And we also had a year off between high school and university in which the imperial assumption was you go out and see the lesser parts or the, the, the more difficult parts of the world and the more impoverished parts of the world with a view to administering and ruling them five years on. So, for example, when I was 17, <clears throat> I spent three months traveling around my parents' India, getting to know India for the first time. I came back and did my last three months uh, of um, study at high school. I then went for three months uh, to Santa Barbara, California, where my parents were living, and worked in... Um, uh, Mexican restaurant while going through the reading list for my university. And I then spent three months uh, traveling by bus from Tijuana down to La Paz, Bolivia, and then up the west coast of South America and back through the West Indies to Miami, from which I took a greyhound back to California. So when I arrived at university at the ripe age of 18, I thought... Uh, I've been trained in the whole of English literature and many other languages. I've spent this last year voyaging fairly extensively across really four different continents. Uh, and I probably had an unseemly sense of the extent of my knowledge and a terrifying absence of sense of the limits of my knowledge. So I think I and many of my friends did feel we knew a lot then. Mm. And you describe in the book, yes, the, the, the school training you in some sense to shepherd empire upon graduation. But, you know, I, I don't, I'm not saying I'm super well read in this part of history, but given the state of British empire in the, the mid 1970s, that's, it's somewhat unrealistic, uh, a, a premise of one's education, isn't it? Thank you. Exactly so. We, we, were, we were trained to rule the empire and only to graduate to find that the empire was 20 years dead and that the natives we were taught to subdue were, in my case, myself. <laughs> we were being taught to go over to India and tell them how to be good Englishmen, and I was somebody of entirely Indian blood for whom this would play out in a very roundabout and indeed ironic way. So I think and when, when I say that we were trained to administer empire, I'm really saying that that school, having been already around for more than 500 years, was slow to adjust to change, uh, as the Englishman in The Quiet American by Graham Greene. And I think now it's adapted wonderfully to the new century, but at that point it, it was as cumbersome as any 500-year-old creature was and, in fact, had mastered and refined brilliantly a, a classical sort of Victorian system for training boys for the, the army and the monastery, essentially, mm. and did that very well. And we were very grateful, at least I was very grateful, to have that training. But you're right, we were being trained for a world that no longer existed. And yet, as I say, I think it's a good training because really it's also teaching you both to travel through the harder parts of the world and to govern yourself and therefore to be a writer. And so when I look back at my life, the one good decision I made was to go back to those English boarding schools because as a writer and a traveler and a perpetual foreigner, uh, it was maybe the ideal training. Hmm. It seems like a, a Graham Greenian kind of notion that the, the, the old way, sure, the old way is, is broken in some grand sense, but uh, the world is a storm and any, any port in it, you know, any, 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 any tool you can pick up, right? He wonderfully said, yes. And I think Graham Greene's books are really about, as I was saying, of the quiet American, um, the dying or dead days of empire, and people who, as I mentioned, resent America just because they see that America is calling all the shots now and they realize that they're superannuated. And I think, again, to go back to the quiet American, the beauty of that book is that the main Englishman is middle-aged and the young American who comes into Vietnam and unsettles him, is just out of Harvard. And the middle-aged man realizes that he's a lesser man than the young, he, younger rival, and his rival in love as well as in politics. And in fact, is always mocking the young American only because he envies his innocence, his idealism, his gallantry, and his openness to the world. And I see that book as, among other things, being about two aspects of Graham Greene um, and two aspects of all of us, the older one of us um, wishing for the recklessness and the heedlessness and innocence and all-knowingness of youth, even as we're grateful 
for the wisdom that the years have brought us. And as I've been traveling around with this book, you've been asking tremendous questions just now. And one of the other great questions that I can recall is I was doing an event in a big theater in San Francisco with an old friend of mine called Don George, with whom I've spoken many times on stage and off. And we were doing this as a private event for a travel company, and our topic was travel, and we came out onto the stage, and Don had brought a copy of my first book and a copy of the most recent book, and we sat down, and I was prepared to, for him to ask me about trips about traveling or what my favorite country was. And his very first question was, he handed me my first book from 1988 and opened it to the author photo, and he said, what do you see when you look at this author photo? Mm. And it was such a brilliant and unexpected question, instantly got us onto very personal and intimate talk. But it's kind of a moody photo, too, isn't it? It's, it looks, it's, almost, it's a cool-looking photo, right? I, I think it is kind of cool. I mean, it's me when I was 29 and still thinking I knew everything about the world and uh, I'm still um, too, too confident. And, of course, by asking me that, he took us right into what I was just talking about, which is how half a, a lifetime on or double the age I was in that picture, how I, I see, envy, and dismiss the person I was then and therefore the writer I was then and therefore that book. And we had a, it instantly opened up into talk about old world and new and spring and autumn, many other things, um, set the sights or, or uh, open the lanes for one of the best such conversations I've had. And then one and a half hours later, after the audience had concluded its questions, Don said, just before we go, I have one final question to you. What do you make of this author photo in the most recent book of, uh, of uh, two months ago. And a beautiful way of bookending the conversation and forcing me again to address the, the merits of age versus youth. Mm. Now, you've, you've, you've gone around on tour, as you've said, for this book, and, and it's brought you finally here to Los Angeles. We can look out the window and see. We can see... A, not one of the more attractive parts of downtown, but you know, downtown. It's this is one of those major cities where, shockingly, the downtown is still being built, even though the city was founded, you know, in the 19th century. Um, but that's the way Los Angeles is. I, I wonder, can you take a Fowlerian position to the pile that is Los Angeles? I mean, that's a little grand. And listeners, if you haven't read The Quiet American, those are the characters. But does that question make any sense at all? If I just throw it at you that way. Thank you. It makes great sense. When you began the question, I was thinking <clears throat> about Paul Theroux, who's written a lot of India recently, and he says as he looked around India, he couldn't tell if the buildings were coming up or falling down, <laughs> if it was in a state of creation or uh, uh, dissolution. And I think that applies to this desolate downtown Los Angeles we're looking out on right now. But beautiful question again, because my glib formulation about Los Angeles now, and California generally, is that it's rooted in the future tense and therefore is wonderful until you're 30 years old and then is a bit frustrating thereafter. So I remember so vividly all the time I was growing up in England, I and my friends had only one dream in life and that was to be a Californian. Mm -hmm. And I was so glad and grateful that my parents lived in Santa Barbara. I could escape my 15th century boarding school. I could come to the center of the youth revolution, the place that was grounded in dreams, that was based on who you could be, um, that was full of these beautiful castles in the air. And all my friends invited themselves over to visit me in Santa Barbara as quickly as they could. We reveled in California's freedom from the past. Um, we had an excess of past in England, and California gave us liberation from that and told us that we could make ourselves up to be anything we wanted. And I've huge partisan and champion of California for many years and, and a defender of it against the people of the old world who saw it as too unformed or too much in the clouds. Until I think there must have come some time in my life when I thought, how much longer can I live in the future tense and in the person I hope to meet and the book I want to write and the optative tense and what I might be 10 years from now. And I think at some point I felt... Well, um, I've now embarked upon this hazardous occupation of writing, and I'm much keener to write books than to dream of writing about them. Mm. And I would know that every book I write is going to be a compromise on that dream, and it will never be the one that I anticipated and hoped to write. And yet, better to have the imperfect book in the world than the perfect book always in my imagination. So... That's to say, at some point, imaginatively, I defected from California. I went back to 
England in the form of Japan, which has a lot in common with England by virtue of being very hierarchically rooted in a very ancient past that's been extremely slow to adapt to the modern world. Japan is futuristic in its surfaces, more in love with fashion than anywhere else, and I believe still the level of values hasn't changed much since the 8th century. And I live in the, the place that was the capital of Japan in the 8th century, Nara. So that was my way of saying I want to be in the present tense and I want to be among people who are held up by the past, who are taught humility and the virtue of limits by the past, and who, while having a future tense, also have a past and present and see how that each depends on the other. And so not just Los Angeles, but the town that we shared the last time we were talking last year, Santa Barbara, and so much of California, to this day, it's always regenerating the world's sense of possibility. It's, it's the place of the future that people from England and Germany and Japan want to come to, and Silicon Valley has given that a whole new iteration. It's still creating next year wonderfully in ways that Germany and England, Japan perhaps couldn't because of the shackles of the past. So... Calif I still believe California is ideal for somebody from outside California who has enough, who imports enough of the past tense to really work usefully with the present. But as I look out on what we're sitting next to, this labyrinth of grey freeways and the, the, the murk of a smoggy early Saturday morning in late February, uh, I do feel a little like Paola, Fowler looking at Pyle and thinking... The idea, idealism and utopianism, to use your word earlier, of California is a tonic, but it can't be the last word. It only has to be the first word in a sentence that goes beyond that. Mm. And you go a quarter mile in one direction, you'll find an, it, a place, you, you'll be among buildings, you, you'll, you'll be in an area that looks eerily similar to Manhattan. You go a couple miles in the other direction, you go to where I live, it's, which is like a smaller downtown, which was half Oaxacan and half Korean. Mm. You go a few more miles, you're at the beach, I can't even really explain that. You know what I mean? I do know <clears throat> just what you mean about uh, L.A. being an anthology of the rest of the world mm. and a wonderful mosaic of many, many other places. I was thinking about Japan, my adopted home, and when I walk down the streets of Kyoto, even the ancient capital, or Tokyo, I see <clears throat> uh, a Mexican restaurant that looks like an Aztec temple, <laughs> a Californian restaurant that looks like a surfer place in Huntington Beach, an Indian restaurant in the shape of the Taj Mahal, uh, a French restaurant that is a note-perfect rendition of uh, the Sixth Arrondissement in Paris, of a kind you don't see in the Sixth Arrondissement of Paris. Again, an anthology of the world's cultures, uh, and a mishmash, and Japan is like uh, a sentence in which a hundred people are speaking all at once in different languages, but Japan can only be a repository for all the world because I think it's deeply Japanese at the core. And in fact, will it promiscuously throw together the styles of everywhere else without changing what it is? Whereas Los Angeles, I think, is a promiscuous anthology of all the world's cultures, but I'm not sure it knows what it is. I think it's in a state of being constantly formed. And you could say Japan is the other extreme, which is it's not deeply affected and transformed enough by these other cultures. It, it partakes of them as we will in a Disneyland or in a salad bar, but, but doesn't take it into its core. Los Angeles seems to take it so much into its core that it doesn't know what it is, and it's maybe suffering a permanent state of identity crisis and is always about to become something but never gets to that state. And in a rather dystopian way, uh, I used to contrast... Los Angeles with Toronto. Mm. And Toronto, as you know, is the most multicultural city on the planet, according to the United Nations. But its big difference to me from L.A. is that it has a vision. And it is small and compact and manageable enough for its administrators from the time of Pierre Trudeau onwards to see that they can create a whole society and a vision and a new global order out of these little pieces of, in its case, Mexico and Hungary and Korea and Iran and India and Pakistan and everywhere else. Uh, whereas Los Angeles, I see the same cultures flooding into the same enormous space, but it's so enormous that nobody can really sit above it and try to create an order. So for people who enjoy the energy of anarchy and the stimulation of everything permanently remaking everything else, Los Angeles is terrific. But if you want a place 
that is navigating the future with direction and clarity and with a sense of order, then I think uh, the Canadian alternatives or the Australian alternatives, even the European alternatives, have more to offer. Mm. You remind me, I want to record some shows in Toronto. This will be a traveling program sooner or later. That's high on the list. You know, it, for, I, think, I forget what book it's in, maybe, maybe Sun After Dark, but you, you have an essay on Toronto and that you saying what you just did in, in many ways and that intrigued me about the place. But you know, I want to touch on the, that phenomenon of, of, of realizing that you're and accepting that the books you write will be compromises. Tell me about the process of coming to terms with the understanding, the acceptance that, that the books you the books you read, the books you had idolized, the books of a Graham Greene, the, the top tier of, of Graham Greene's bibliography, you know, that they are also compromises. How did you? How did you? How have you come to accept that? Well, I anticipated you ask better and more searching questions than anybody else, and you've lived up to my anticipation. I mean, wonderful. Uh, and Graham Greene was fascinated by failure. And he said that his definition of a saint really was somebody who knows that he's failed in everything. Uh, and he hated success. And, and people like George Orwell saw success as a kind of imperialism and a, and a, and a cruel arrogance to foist upon the world. So, uh, Gra- you know, I think, um, was it Beckett who said that the writer's job is to fail better every time, which Zadie Smith quotes very beautifully in her extraordinary collection of um, essays called Changing My Mind. And her title itself shows how provisional book writing is. So Graham Greene was interesting, alarming to some people in some ways, in that he was such a technical master that he would write exactly 500 words a day. He would stop in the middle of the sentence. His intuition told him he'd reach 500. He'd count it and he'd write in his spidery handwriting along the margins, 500, and resume the next day. He would also, astonishingly, write to a friend in a letter, I've just embarked on a novel and it's going to be 69,400 words, 230 pages, let's say. And four years later, at the end of it, it would be 69,375, that he could anticipate to the page almost how long his books would be, which is, to many a writer, an example of seeming to be over-planning <laughs> and not, not open enough to uh, imagination taking you in a different direction. And yet... Uh, I think he saw, I'm projecting here, but I think he saw his books as I see mine, which are journeys, which by definition you don't want to complete and and never should and could be what you anticipate. And each journey only sends you back home eager to incorporate what you've just learned into the next journey. But they're not really about success and failure in that sense. They don't go as as you had anticipated. They take you to different places. You remember when you got home all the places that you didn't see or didn't see in the right light or didn't see deeply enough. But but fine, that's the process of life and that's those that's what you take into uh, the next journey. And so with each book, I try to make my books as different from the previous book as possible in the way of journeys, like going to a different continent each time, not hoping or expecting to master that continent, but feeling that what you bring back from it will inform your next trip. Green distrusted theories, seemingly distrusted ideologies, distrusted uh, opinions, and he, he seems to have been a writer who, for whom the, 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 the actual physical one-time only experience was the thing to be written about. The, the Staying away from the generalization of that and extrapolation from that. Do, do you wonder, in thinking about Green, how it was that the man could actually bring himself to trust words, given you know how much, how in the moment he seemed to think? And <clears throat> does, does, does that approach, does that approach an actual, an actual quality of, of Green, what, I, what I've just tried to explain? Hmm. A part of me thinks that words are all he trusted. Mm. And he would often say he didn't know how people could survive without writing. Mm -hmm. So I think writing was a form of therapy for him. It was a way of exorcising his demons, a way of confronting parts in himself that he never could have otherwise, a way of finding out what he cared about. And I think whether you publish the words or not, for him, they were a tunnel into the shadowy passages of the subconscious that otherwise you can never access. And 
To me, as you can tell from having read the book, one of the striking features of Green's biography was that when he was 16, he tried to run away from his boarding school, partly because his father was the headmaster there. He failed in that, but remarkably for 1920s middle-class England, his parents decided to send him to live for six months in London with a Jungian dream analyst. And I think that dream analyst became a shadowy counterfather for Green, so that to the end of his days, including the last novel he ever published when he was 84 years old, The Captain and the Enemy, he's writing about boys who leave their upstanding official daylight fathers, descend into an, an underground world, uh, a shadowy parallel domain, an alternative use of the universe, uh, presided over by a colourful, charming, usually somewhat criminal um, Counterfather and his mull. So I think his time with the Jungian dream analyst taught Green to uh, have a huge respect for dreams and to see how dreams can tell the future as much as the past. And I think he saw, I'm guessing as I do, uh, dreaming, writing as a counter dreaming and a, an equivalent of dreaming and another way of tapping the subconscious and bringing its mysteries out into the world without claiming or trying to understand them. And so I think he trusted what he couldn't explain, and that means he trusted dreams and he trusted the words of the imagination because he knew that he wasn't in control of them and that something bigger and more mysterious than himself, call it the god or call it the devil, came out in his prose as it might not in his more conscious, rational life. Uh, and... Uh, when you talk about not trusting words, I think that applies to me. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a whole essay about how the more I write, the more I sit in one place. And the more I sit in one place, the more I'm untaken in by the words that are constantly passing through me at here one second and gone the next. And it's like sitting where we are, looking out on a scene through large picture windows and seeing the clouds in perpetual motion. So the, the clouds are real, but they're also as ephemeral as anything can be. Every time you and I look out on the sky, it'll probably be a little different. And that's how I think about the mind as I look at it at my desk. So I don't trust any words at all. But I think Graham Greene did precisely because of their mystery. Hmm. And you describe in the book your your school life, which involved you know, going to school, going to boarding school, this 500-year-old school in England, and then flying back home to where your family was in Santa Barbara, where you, your father had a, attracted a, you know, a coterie of, of students who were the, I guess, the, the late teens, early 20s of the, of the 60s and 70s in California with utopian ideas. People like me who, who didn't live through that time would maybe call them hippies, maybe correctly, I, I don't know, mm. but... Did spending time among the Santa Barbara hippies inoculate, inoculate you against hippiedom? And did spending time in the boarding school inoculate you against the perhaps excessive claims of, of stark traditionalism? I mean, it, it, the, what I'm getting at is, is inoculate the right term to use when talking about how this affected your mind, being in both places, not at once, but might as well have been. Uh, another astonishing question. Inoculation is a, is a perfect word. Uh, and maybe I would just say that I could see each of those worlds through the eyes of the other and therefore could be sceptical of each of them. But of course, because I was in both of them, I could also see the virtues. I could see very much what California had that England and classical 16th century England desperately lacked in the way of freshness and openness to the world and optimism and excitement. We, we need those in our lives. I mean, in, in some level, my book might be about how we always have to have a fowler and a pile inside ourselves. We always need the voices and perspectives of old world and new, of middle age and youth, of innocism, innocence and skepticism. I sometimes think that all my books are about bringing uh, skepticism and faith into the same picture into the same sentence, into the same perspective, so that one's not as closed as an ancient England would be, and not as dangerously open and unready for the world as perhaps parts of 60s California were, but that each are making really important contributions. Um, Twenty years ago, when I was beginning my writing life, my very wise editor at the time suggested I go and spend three months traveling around England. Uh, to write a book on it. And I did, and I assembled uh, hundreds of pages of notes in 1991. And very quickly, I realized that my theme for that book would be 
the interplay and dialogue and collaboration, maybe, of skepticism and faith. Mm. And all those pages just gathered dust in my room, and I never wrote up the book because I found I couldn't make England new enough to myself because I'd lived there for 21 years and been born there. But here we are, here the talk about the mysteries of the subconscious. 20 years later, I write a book about Graham Greene, maybe, in California and Japan and travel and many other things, and I think it was that book that I didn't write then about skepticism and faith and their dialogue with uh, England standing here for skepticism, California for hope, uh, Graham Greene for a skepticism that longs for hope, California standing for the hope that needs perhaps a slightly more skeptical eye. When you were describing my father, as you just did perfectly, what I was thinking as I listened to you talk was that, of course, his coterie of students did think of him. He was their chosen father. He was their Graham Greene. He was the person who was the embodiment of what they didn't have enough of growing up. Um, and, well, he might be as somebody from the old world who had this very rigorous intellectual tradition but who'd consecrated himself to hope. And so growing up, flying back and forth six times a year from the age of nine between England and, and California, I did feel I was going back and forth between a city of history that didn't have much place for hope, a city of hope that didn't necessarily have enough of a sense of history, but maybe that each would be complementary. And as you know, all my writing since my very first book, which is about the dreams that the West has on the ancient East and the dreams that the ancient East brings to the West, is about exactly uh, that, that dialogue between innocence and experience between the cover photo of me when I was in my 20s and the cover photo of me when I was in my 50s and the way each needs the other. And that's, of course, what I'm projecting onto Green's novel, The Quiet American, and many other things that he wrote. Um, you described them as hippies, but you said maybe that wasn't the right word. It, it was the right word, and counterculture is certainly mm. what the word that always comes to mind to me in that context. And in any place from Los Angeles to England... You need a culture and you need a counterculture. You need, you need um, that dialectic in, in, in action. Uh, so I would never want... I, I was so grateful then, and I'm so grateful now, to have imbibed uh, all the expansiveness and the spaciousness and the openness of California then. Uh, and I'm grateful, too, to have got from England a slight sense of irony or skepticism to put that all in place. It's it's a word that is so loaded in this context that I just I wince to use it, but it does seem like some of the, the students who 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 were drawn to your father used him as a kind of guru. You can see why I don't want to use that word, mm. but I'm, I'm sure he I'm sure he was was not a big fan of that word either. I would imagine, right? I don't know. It's an Indian word, and he came from yeah. India. <laughs> but it's even so, you know. Anyway, yes. he was a we'll, teacher. Though. We'll say that, yes. but. I think that, that Hunter Thompson had his most eloquent moment, and many people share this opinion. Uh, it's not unique to me. In the middle of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, when he describes in the late 60s being in Northern California and feeling that you know anywhere he went, he would find openness and progressiveness, and he would be, he would be embraced, and he would embrace others, and the, the forces of the young and, and, and the, the searching would simply prevail over the, as he called it, the old and the evil and the crusty that, you know, no fight was necessary. Uh, so, you know, why bother struggling? That this, this new world was coming into being. And he writes from that perspective in 1971, I believe, in the book, that if you got, you know, if you got up on the rocks or at the right angle and you looked, you could see the point. You could see the point where the, uh, the wave just broke and rolled away in the late 60s of, of all that. And what, you don't address this in the book, and I, maybe it's not even a topic you, you want to discuss, but what did the collapse of that counterculture, the, what was the effect of that on your father, who, who seemed to draw so many adherents of that culture around him? You know, the, the ultimate discreditation of American hippiedom. Did, did that have an effect on him? Did, did, do you think he, th he thought much about that? Hmm, I've never thought about that myself, but I think he would say that hope is never discredited. Mm. And the kind of idealism that he really enshrined, and I think the reason that so many were really excited to listen to him, initially as a professor of political science, but more as a teacher of classical ideas, is that he was teaching Plato and Emerson and anarchism and Bakunin and the great philosophical pillars of that vision. And his 
most famous book was on the moral and political thought of Mahatma Gandhi. In other words, Gandhi not just as a one-off reformer, but belonging to a great and very distinguished tradition that should continue and will continue forever. And so he would say Plato is as relevant in the year 2012 as in 1968. Mm -hmm. And if we don't sufficiently heed him now the way we did then, that's our loss because he has as much to offer these days as, as he did them. What his students think, because they were living the 60s dream perhaps more intensely than he, because he was coming to California from a rigorous training in British India and then a rigorous training as a philosopher in Oxford. Um, so he, he had that much larger picture in which to put California in the 60s. Mm -hmm. The people who grew up in California in the 60s as its heirs may have felt more disappointed than he at the waves crashing against the shore in the 1970s. I'm so excited that you mention Hunter Thompson because he was, I've never spoken about him in any context, but he, in so many complicated ways, embodies every aspect of that from the hopefulness, and he was the voice of revolution and transformation and all of that, to being kind of a voice of skepticism also, or the wise, unillusioned eye that saw when the revolution had reached its peak. So when... I was growing up in England in the 60s and especially in the 70s. For me and all my friends, Hunter Thompson was the man. And I cite him in this book as an exact example, along with Richard Brautigan and Tom Robbins, whom I don't mention, and the Village Voice, which I subscribed to in my 15th century English boarding school that came by sea mail two months late, and it cost me $10 for a year subscription, 52 issues of the Village Voice for just $10. And I... I I subscribed to it when I was 16 in Eton in 1973, partly because I knew it was super cool and all our friends wanted to get what the Village Voice or Hunter Thompson represented, but also because I really did feel that those uh, pieces without capital letters recording what was going down in New York in 73 and Andy Warhol's New York and the East Village and the rest of it, that was exactly what we hungered to for and needed to hear in uh, 15, 15, in 1440s, 15th century England. But Hunter Thompson, and so I've kept up with him. Uh, one of my proudest possessions is somebody recently brought back, just before he died, for me, a signed edition, of a uh, first edition of Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. He is an iconic figure for me, partly because he represents, I think, idealism without ideology. And when he brought out his first volume of letters, I think it was in 1997, I reviewed them for Time magazine. Uh, I called them deliriously readable. And what I loved reading his letters was that, as you know probably, he was a copy editor at Time magazine. He schooled himself by writing out, I think, the books of Fitzgerald or Kerouac. He would literally transcribe them, write out every word. He trained himself in a really disciplined way to be a writer, and a reader, and he brought that formidable apparatus to the chaos and convulsions of the 60s. If he'd been in the middle of those convulsions, he wouldn't have been able to articulate them. He's known for the Hunter Thompson caricature he became, who was always writing on you know, 60 tabs of acid all at once against deadline four months late about his own dissolution and society's dissolution. But what you see from those, read from those letters was that Thompson was a very serious writer and reader and a serious thinker who never threw himself into the madness of the 60s, uh, who didn't subscribe to the chaos, but did subscribe to the possibility, and who was prepared to champion and articulate the counterculture ideal without ever wanting to call himself a hippie or a counterculture, who saw, who saw its limits, who saw around its corners, but who also saw its possibilities. And the seeing of its possibilities was what makes him such an exhilarating and unique writer, even now, that I hope is going to be cherished 50 years from now as the great chronicler of 60s California, because he believed in his possibilities, but also could see his limits. So I think he's, he's the great Graham Greenian recorder of that moment. Sometimes I'll, I'll take a Hunter Thompson book when I'm traveling, and you, you write in, in your new book about traveling with the books of Graham Greene, of course, uh, traveling with your wife Hiroko, traveling with your mother, traveling with uh, your longtime friend Lewis. Tell me, d traveling with, you know, quote-unquote, with... Graham Greene with, with these books and, and traveling with Hiroko or Lewis or your mother, these, 
you cast them in somewhat similar terms. I mean, how, how different how different is it to how different a traveling companion is a person versus uh, a writer as embodied in the books you choose to take with you or happen to find where you go? Thank you. Another question nobody's asked. And it's infinitely better for me, as you could probably gauge from reading my book, to travel with a book than a person. (laughs) Because when I'm traveling with a Graham Greene novel, of course I'm traveling with the Graham Greene I choose to create. And I am shifting and amending that Graham Greene, imagined, projected Graham Greene, according to the needs of the situation. So if I'm in Havana, I will create one Graham Greene on the page that I need to be walking through the streets of Cuba with me, and if I'm in Saigon, another, and if in Paraguay, another. And I can't take those liberties with my mother or my friend Louis or Hiroko. So I've always felt that if I want to write and if I want to think about the world and if I want to engage with the world, I have to travel alone. And I travel in a different way with uh, certainly my mother and Hiroko, and that's when I want to share aspects of the world that I've enjoyed with them. I feel that they don't have as much chance to travel as I do, so I'm eager to give them that opportunity and to take them to places that they want to go and to be their companion. And usually uh, with my mother, I find out the places she wants to go to, and I go there as her sidekick and her expediter. But they're, they're her trips, and I am, I am just the one lucky enough to go along with them. With Hiroko... I take her to places that I've enjoyed that I think she will enjoy, and that Venn diagram doesn't overlap in so many places, but it's about giving her a holiday because she works hard around the year and around the clock in in a shop in Japan and doesn't have the liberty to keep swanning off as I do. Mm -hmm. So those those are trips in service of their needs. But when I take the occasional trip in the service of my need, I feel that the whole point of it is not to be who I am at home and not to know who I'm going to be in advance, to be shaken out of my regular everyday habits and assumptions and to be loose in the world not knowing what's coming next. And so long as I'm with somebody I know, even my great traveling companion from school, uh, I'm stuck in those old habits. Mm -hmm. So Graham Greene is a perfect because serviceable companion that I can mold like a piece of plasticine, if that's not an English term, to wherever I am, uh, whereas these living people, uh, not so. Mm. And when you consult the traveling companion that is Graham Greene in a book, do, do you think that, and I suppose this, this is so much the theme of your book that maybe I should already know the answer, but do, do, you, do you think that Greene reflects you or has he somehow predicted you? If, you, if you get the distinction I'm drawing there. I get the distinction, and I would say he predicts me he reflects me, he guides me, um, understands me, and anticipates me. Yeah. Uh, so as you know from the book... Well, what doesn't he do, I guess? Right. Good question. What doesn't he do? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there are substantial differences between him and me. But having spent eight years working on nothing but this book, writing 3,000 pages, publishing only 250 of them... I would gladly spend the rest of my life doing nothing except read more and more and more of Graham Greene, reread The Quiet American a 17th time, a 23rd time, a 26th, and he's become sufficiently like an old friend that, like my school friend Louis, with whom I've been traveling for 40 years, or like Hiroko, my wife, whom I've known pretty well for 25 years, the beauty of an old friend is you know her gestures and her ways so well while acknowledging what you don't know, as we were talking about earlier, Mm -hmm. that... Even when she pauses, it can break your heart. Or even when she can't get out a sentence, you can see all the feelings that are behind her hesitations. She um, swipes back her hair, and you know all, or you feel, you know, many of the emotions that go behind the things that she's not saying. Mm -hmm. And that's how I am with Graham Greene. Each time I read The Quiet American, it devastates me more because I can feel the pressure of what I imagine, maybe wrongly, to be the feelings behind every sentence and every clause. So each time I come upon a single sentence there, it wipes me out more than what the first time I, I read it. Um, and as I say all this, I'm sort of forgetting your question, but you're right, the, the, uh, the book is about how, traveling especially, I feel myself stumbling through my a Graham Greene novel. I feel he scripted my life. I feel he's got there before me. Uh, and he's given me a useful way to think about the world, to see my circumstances abroad in the context of a Graham Greene book, and uh, maybe to voyage into the future. <laughs>
And there are other writers who do that. Uh, there's so many men within my head, and I wrote this book and I chose this title because everyone alive and everybody listening to our talk has people inside her head, many of them. So I have D.H. Lawrence and Keats and Emerson and Thoreau and Emily Dickinson and Melville inside my head, and different aspects of my experience, I connect with d different of those people and their visions. So Graham Greene is just one tiny corner of myself, but more than any writer, he speaks to the foreigner alone in a hotel in a beaten up country where he doesn't know right from left or right from wrong. Um, and Graham Greene is the patron saint of that condition. I've been speaking in downtown Los Angeles with Pico Iyer, author of many books, including Video Night in Kathmandu, The Open Road, a whole bunch of them in between. Uh, I, I like Falling Off the Map a lot, although I was rereading that recently, but there's many. Um, and, of course, the new one, The Man Within My Head. Pico, thanks so much for taking the time, and always a pleasure. It's a real delight, Colin, and thank you for your questions. Uh, the extent to which you've steeped yourself in this book and all my books is the ultimate luxury for a writer. And I, I can honestly say this is the last interview I'm giving for this book, and none has been so fresh and surprising and thought-provoking. So thank you. Okay. Pleasure is all mine. Uh, this has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. By the way, you can keep up with all of the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the website, colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to the people backing this season, including Aidan Nullman, Andy Cooney, Ben Bartley, Brian J. Dell, Doubt Us Artwork, Greg Bigelow, Greg Linster, Henry Coronan, Humberto Grant, James Faber, Jonathan McKelmont, Mark Larson, Matt Warren, Mia Muratori, Nicholas Croft, Paul Doyle, Ray McGuire, Rob Montz, Robert Foley, Roberto Medri, Samuel Hansen, Sean Dudley, Small Demons, Stephen Inglaze, Steve Hemmer, TSD, and Wayne Wright. 